Good morning. Welcome to uh, Science-Based Choices for Climate Action, uh, hosted at Dickinson College. We're very pleased to have you uh, here with us in the audience uh, uh, here on campus, as well as the virtual audience. Um, the, we had a, an excellent session this morning to get us started on, on the science policy uh, interface. We had a great day yesterday. We're looking forward to some really good sessions today. Um, I'm going to take a, a brief moment to, to just call out some thanks. Uh, we'll be doing this later as well. But uh, we've got a, a fabulous AV crew, uh, Bill Trigo, uh, Kevin Schof, uh, Ben Batchelor, I think, maybe helping uh, uh, today. Jennifer Love was helping yesterday. Um, so uh, just, uh, you know, thank you for, like, Things have been running smoothly. Um, I've been really <laughs> pleased with that. So, so uh, thank you very much. Um, so. Um uh, just in case there is an emergency, we've got exits, uh, one off to the left here, exits at the top right and left at the back, uh, another set of handicapped accessible exits uh, out uh, behind me this way. Um, so do keep those, those in mind. Um, um, so now I'll just turn things over to Professor Beatty, who's uh, going to uh, moderate a, a conversation with our, our guests uh, on the topic of uh, uh, land and ecosystems and climate change. Great, thanks so much, Neil. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that better? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Heather Beatty, and I'm an associate professor of environmental studies, and I'm also with the Food Studies Certificate Program here at Dickinson College. And it's my honor today to moderate this panel. Um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers, um, and then I'm going to ask one of them to contextualize the land and ecosystems and climate change um, kind of broader set of conclusions recently from the IPCC. And then uh, the other one will actually kind of dive into what that looks like on the ground in relation to the conference of the parties. And they're going to explain what that means. Um, then we're going to have a little bit of um, some facilitated questions. And then we're going to open it up to you. So students, get your questions ready. Don't be surprised when I'm asking folks for questions. So start thinking of things that you want to ask, because we'll prioritize uh, student questions because we're an undergraduate uh, institution. For folks on YouTube, please put your questions into the uh, live stream uh, chat, and those are being moderated as well. We hope to get to at least one or two of those. So I'm really honored today to have Gillian Bowser here today, who's an associate professor in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability at Colorado State University, which is in Fort Collins. And Dr. Bowser focuses on the ecological indicators of climate change. She places special emphasis on sustainability, citizen scientist engagement, and encouraging more students from underrepresented backgrounds to study science, and in turn to be part of processes like the ones that we're talking about today. And this really came up in the last panel as well. Dr. Bowser has worked as a wildlife biologist and ecologist for the US National Park Service in Yellowstone, Grand Tetons, Joshua Tree, and Wrangell St. Elias, and was an AAAS Science and Diplomacy Fellow in 2011. She serves on the board for the Rocky Mountain Sustainability and Science Network and participated in the UN Framework on Climate Change Convention and UN Global Environmental Outlook. Uh, she also has a National Science Foundation grant where she takes students to the Conference of the Parties, um, which is really an amazing thing to get them to engage with those processes and understand it. Our other guest who's joining us via Zoom from Zurich is Dr. Andreas Fischlin, who's the Professor Emeritus of ETH Zurich and the IPCC Vice Chair. Um, Dr. Fischlin is head of the Terrestrial Systems Ecology Group since its formation in November 1988. For his work on, quote, teaching means in the field of electrical engineering, he won the Denzler Award in 1989 of the Swiss Electrotechnical Association. He has been the convening lead author of the chapter Climate Change Impacts on Forests um, of Climate Change 1995, the IPCC's second assessment report, and has recently served as the senior coordinating lead author of the chapter Ecosystems, Their Properties, Goods, and Services. Um, this latter work made him a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. 
Dr. Fishlin was co-facilitator of the Structured Expert Dialogue of the first periodic review of the UN Framework on Climate Change and has served as a member of the Swiss delegation to the UN Framework on Climate Change for 17 years. Um, he helped click, kick off RED um, and substan substantially influenced the Paris Climate Agreement. So to contextualize our presentation today, Dr. Fishlin is very briefly going to give us a high-level understanding of where we're at in terms of land, ecosystems, and the climate. And then uh, Dr. Bowser is actually going to talk to us a bit about equity issues in relation to the Conference of the Parties. So we'll briefly uh, pass it off to Dr. Fishlin for that contextualization. OK. Um, hello, everybody. I hope uh, you all hear me. Um, I'm greeting you from Zurich, and it's a pleasure to be with you. I would like to sh just um, say a few words to sort of set the stage. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, has said the climate emergency is a race we are losing, but it is a race we can win. And what I would like to um, invite you is to just consider a few aspects, in particularly what ecosystems, what is the role the ecosystems play in this race? And perhaps it helps if I remind you that ecosystems provide essential services and we have a tradition to group those services, for instance, in provisional services, such as the food production or wood bioenergy production. And then secondly, we distinguish the regulating services, for instance, the carbon sequestration. I would like to remind you that about 30% of all human emissions, which are currently released to the atmosphere, are immediately sequestered back by the terrestrial, that is the land ecosystems alone. And in addition to that very substantial uh, ecosystem service, we of course have many others uh, such as air and water purification and so on. And the third important group of ecosystem services, for instance, recreation, tourism, uh, tradition, including even spiritual values. Now, all these um, directly profiting humans uh, ecosystem services. There are also the so-called supporting services. And one I consider to be very important to keep in mind is that the maintenance of biodiversity. Uh, without ecosystems, there is no way how we can preserve biodiversity. And um, I would like uh, to say a few things on that before we start the panel discussion. Now, these ecosystem services um, have also been valued in a way which can be questioned. By the way, I'm, I'm the last who wouldn't be very critical of such approaches. But nevertheless, I would like to mention it. Uh, this famous Costanza et al. paper has estimated an economical valuation of the ecosystem services to amount between 16 and 54 trillions of US dollars at a time when the global GDP was 18 trillions. So what this means that ecosystems are at least adding another 90% of the economical value uh, as assessed by a GDP and perhaps up to 300% more. So that's even four times the amount of the uh, GDP. So whatever we want to think about such an approach, I think it shows or demonstrates how important ecosystem services are. Now, as I said, those ecosystem services depend on the supporting services, and one of them is the maintenance of biodiversity. And I just wanted to quickly um, introduce you to some of the assessments we made in, the sec uh, in, the, in this recent sixth assessment report of the Working Group 2 report. 
where we have uh, developed and used widely this uh, so-called method of showing risks in uh, form of a burning ember. So we have colors from white to purple, uh, which cover the whole range of risks from undetectable, that would be white, to very high purple. And just let's look at this assessment, which is based on many, many studies uh, where the, the risk of biodiversity loss uh, has recently based on the most recent uh, scientific literature being assessed. So at the present, we have a global warming of 1.09 degree, roughly 1.1 degree. And at this level of global warming, we have risks detectable and attributable with at least medium confidence, according to the color of this ember here. And if we look at a global warming of 1.5, which is perhaps not too far away in the future, then risks are starting to become significant and widespread. And if we go to a temperature which perhaps is something like well below two degrees, as it is specified in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, then risks are high already. And high means they are significant and widespread. And then when we go to a temperature, let's say only two and a half degrees, which is a half degree above the two degrees, then the risks have become very high. And they have become very high because they are severe and irreversible. So we see there is a clear relationship between a global surface temperature change and a biodiversity loss or the risks of biodiversity loss. So um, just let me come back for our panel to this statement, the climate emergency is a race we are losing. Um, I, in this context, would like perhaps to say uh, working group three has assessed that the limit of 1.5 degree of global warming becomes almost unreachable unless the world starts reducing emissions by 2025. Uh, steadily, the emissions should go down from there on. So I think climate change policies are worth fighting for. That's all I wanted to say at the moment. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Fishlin, for giving us that overview. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Bowser, and we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. Dr. Fishlin gave us a sense of where we're at in relation to biodiversity loss. How does that information actually get translated into um, policies and ideas uh, moving forward? So Dr. Bowser is going to kind of unearth the world of the Conference of the Parties and how that relates to the IPCC, so taking that knowledge and understanding it. So she's going to explain this a little bit more, but the parties refer to the 197 nations that agreed to a new environmental pact, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, referred to as the UNFCC, um, at a meeting in 1992. What Dr. Bowser is going to do right now is explain that connection between the two, the Conference of the Parties and the IPCC, but also explain the equity implications of the intersectional approach that's taken to understand the social and physical impacts of climate change and thinking about who's included in those dialogues and what are the impact on the ground. So I'll pass it over to her now for that. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I actually want to start with a story. Um, a little story, um, this only took place last year in Glasgow, Scotland. And in Glasgow, Scotland, there was a people summit the first time that the, I, the UNFCCC um, Conference of the Parties hosted a people summit. And what was cool about this summit was that at each speaker from the youth group that got up and spoke, and there were about 10 speakers, each read one statement from the IPCC, IPCC's summary for policymakers. And as they finished their statement, they all said, the science has spoken, and now it's time to act. So I want to do is sort of pull back together what that means when we talk about the science has spoken, and now it's time to act, and more importantly, the role of youth and youth action. But to do that, you sort of need to look at the 
COP through several lenses, and many people like to describe the Conference of the Parties as a three-ring circus. It's a little bit crazy, um, it's a little bit nutty. Uh, one circus is you know, the negotiations, one part of the circus is the pavilions, or country bragging spaces, we like to call them, and the third is civil society. And why it becomes an important is because as you move the IPCC's findings through policy and context of science, you need to understand what the COP itself is doing at the same time, because it's moving at its own pace. So I've attended the, the, the COPs with Neil and others since Copenhagen, um, this is COP 15, and you could look at the COP as a, as a movement of our understanding of green, greenhouse gases. There's a lot of what the IPCC focuses on, but there's actually another parallel movement going on, and that is the engagement of the countries themselves and how they see, as our last panel talked about, how do they see it coming closer and closer and closer to societal issues and society needs? So I want to just give you a little bit of a sense of how the COP moves, the science moves, and then there's this whole huge side event of equity that is moving very rapidly through the COP. And so I tend to call these the dance steps because it's like a, a dance floor, but you have this big negotiation going on. We're talking about science and greenhouse gases, but there's a fast moving ship in terms of equity that often gets overlooked. So COP15. It's a good example to start. So you look at COP15, we thought about it as sort of a failed COP. It didn't do all that much, but it was the first time that equity was brought into fully into the conversation, that the COP itself in its body needed to look at equity because people were part of the whole issue and how we brought those up. And as that came forward, there were two big things that moved. What is the role of gender in climate change? Is climate change equitable? And if it's not equitable, how do we bring that into the processes? Uh, every step of the COP. So you think about that, the, climate, the gender climate action plan started right after COP16 to say that women have to have an equal role, change that perspective of the science and the policy space in every body of the COP, and that's called the gender action plan. And things kept moving. We get to Paris, or right before Paris, as many, if I don't know who here attended Paris, but the terrorist events that came, that happened three weeks before the Paris Paris COP, three weeks, in the city of Paris. So the Paris COP was obviously the unity COP, and they talk about that all of unity. How do we recognize the role of every different group so that we don't have another terrorist type event? That we don't have groups that are splintering off? So it was called the unity COP. But also the unity COP was the first time in the Paris Agreement, it's my, my favorite quiz question for my students, um, where does ecosystems occur in the Paris Agreement is mostly in finance, which Andreas has, had worked on. If you look at where forests appear, and oceans only appear in the preamble. And in the preamble of the Paris Agreement, for the first time, there are two words that were brought into the Paris Agreement that hugely influence where the COP is now. And those two words are Mother Earth. And those were negotiated by the, the Bolivian uh, delegation to say that Mother Earth is a cultural concept as much as it is a natural concept, and you cannot separate those two. So if you look at Glasgow, going back to Glasgow in 20, in 20, last year, the term Mother Earth is brought back in, that there's a cultural context that needs to move with everything that we do. So Mother Earth was born in COP21. If you keep moving forward, COP22 was the African COP. And to bring in what is the Global South doing versus the Global North, and how do we balance these two, and how do we balance them such that every option of the COP keeps that balance. And what's interesting to think about that particular COP was that was also the first time, it's actually the country of Canada brought in an entirely female negotiating team to the floor. So you see these dramatic changes that are going on at the same time we're negotiating greenhouse gases, and what is the influence of that? So when we got to the Tlaloga dialogues in COP23, the country of Fiji brought this idea that we are all in the same canoe and brought forward that the small island states have a voice that is very different than the developing countries and the global north, global south, and all the things that are going on, but we're all in the same canoe. We all need to pilot the same rate. And the Tlaloga dialogues, we're having people speak together at equal voice, and we heard that at the end of that panel. And that's so important because that led to the next COP in Katowice, where we finally acknowledge traditional and local knowledge would be in every body of the COP. So it means that different ways of knowing were being brought into, and there was a question earlier in the last panel, on how do we bring those different voices into the COP? 
Well, it is actually now mandated as part of the bodies of the COP that traditional and local knowledge must be considered in all actions. So it's just interesting to think about how you move the next year the Human Rights Convention, C Commission was brought into a full office. So when you brought the term human rights fully into the COP, it meant that global climate change was a human rights issue. And even though climate justice was introduced in COP15, now you've operationalized it. Human rights are every part of our negotiating body. And it's something that we have to think about. We can't just talk about gas molecules. We can't just talk about this. We have to talk about the human rights implications of all of the above. So I'd like to make people think about, or not to make, but to have you think about that the COP moved on greenhouse gases, but at the same time it made dramatic moves on equity, dramatic moves on gender and gender representation, and tried to keep those two things together. So you can now ask the question, is climate change equitable? And know where those voices sit in every body of the COP. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I just wanted to bring you to thinking about the COP, not just about greenhouse gases, but as an environmental body that has done more in terms of equity, gender, representation, traditional knowledge, et cetera, in conjunction with greenhouse gases and the impacts of those greenhouse gases on many people. So thank you. Great. That was wonderful from both of you to orient us on these important issues. And students, again, we're going to be going for questions in a couple minutes, so keep, keep them coming or ready to go. So in our last session, Fatima Denton talked about how we can't decouple science from society. And I think in both of your preliminary overviews, you've alluded to both science and society. So she furthered that science can solve social problems. So can you respond to that in relation to biodiversity and land? And if you agree with Fatima Denton that science can solve social problems, what does that look like in relation to biodiversity and land? Should we start with Dr. Bowser and then we'll go to Dr. Fishlin? Sure. I, so I think one, oops. I think one issue to think about, actually just two words, and that's land tenure. You know, we look at science and, and social problems and understanding who owns land, who is not allowed to own land. And we tend to think about that as a non-US problem, right? In many countries, women are not allowed to own land. But look at the American West for a moment. And if you think about science and social problems, science and social issues, who owns water west of the Mississippi? It's an incredibly comp, and you guys are all mostly east of the Mississippi, or right? so you probably haven't thought about the land owner, the water ownership issues in the West, and what's called primacy ownership. So when you look at primacy ownership, that's an equity problem. When you look at drought, that's a science problem. And then how do you put those two back together to understand how they, the simple issue of land primacy, first person in owns the water, but who decided that were mostly settlers. So that means first person in should have been native, right? But they're not. I, don't th I think only one tribe actually owns its water. So you think about that and they say, okay, science is now saying that as drought changes, we're increasing this equity problem. We're increasing this inequity problem because who owns water in the West is not equitable and it has no structure to get to be equitable because of the primacy law. So I think this is a way to think about how these two things can move together and move apart. And one last quick question, comment on land tenure. We think about land tenure as being fairly equal, but is it in the agricultural world? I just think about that. For who owns many of the large agricultural lands? A lot of them are corporate, but artesian farmers, especially in places like Colorado, are mostly women. It's this fascinating piece. So you think about who owns land and that what allows you to adapt or mitigate our climate change impact is not an equitable future, right? So we just have to think about how that moves. Yeah, and that relates to an issue last night at the panel too, is where are these large scale um, solar initiatives or wind, where are they gonna go? And it's usually on agricultural yeah. land. Dr. Fishlin, do you wanna respond to uh, Fatima Denton's idea about uh, science and society? Yeah, sure. Um, what Gilliam just said sort of reminded me that the invention of agriculture has maybe, uh, some people say, anthropologists say, created the foundation for social inequity, uh, which might have been much smaller previously. And um, when hunters and gatherers was sort of the form of, of living, 
of the human species. Um, but let me perhaps to, to really respond to what Fatima Danton has, has sort of raised. I think it's a sort of a chicken and uh, egg question uh, when you think of what I just said, because the maybe agricultural scientific understanding in the sense of, of empirical knowledge uh, as the beginning of any science has changed societies and sh uh, shaped societies. And this science has also today allowed us with, with technologies like the invention of, of the uh, engines um, and also burning fossil fuels has sort of created problems which exacerbate social inequity problems at the moment. And on the other hand, and that's why I said chicken and egg, I would like to emphasize that the second assessment report, I, I'm not sure to which extent that was said in previous panels, but I, it doesn't hurt to repeat it again. One key finding from our report is that first, without um, the land ecosystems starting to degenerate after about 10 years and suffer too much from climate change, where the ecosystem services start going down the drain, uh, if I may say that in, in such a rough way, um, then we have a difficulty in, in tackling the climate change problem. And at the same time, as Gilliam has, has emphasized, we have a lot of land ecosystem issues like um, tenancy and so on, uh, which unless they are properly dealt with, we cannot uh, control climate change. We cannot stop uh, global warming because we need the contribution, for instance, from the land ecosystems in order to tackle this problem. Of course, um, reducing emissions and bringing them to zero uh, is something which can largely done without the ecosystems themselves, but that is not sufficient to limit global warming, for instance, to 1.5 degree. Beyond net zero, we need also negative emissions, and net, uh, these net negative emissions, they cannot be uh, realized, implemented without land ecosystems. I'm thinking here of bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. Great, we're gonna open it up to student questions and I don't see any yet from online, but as those potentially come in, we'll do that. So we're gonna prioritize students. Grace is being nice and brave right over here in the middle. Yeah, so um, I think it's great to see how equity has been progressing through the COP so far. Um, but how can we progress going forward? And are there groups that are still being left out? I know in the last session we brought up um, how including indigenous voices hasn't really been done yet, um, but are there other gaps in equity and how can we include that? And um, furthermore, um, is environmental justice considered by delegates currently? Uh, domestically, I know that we talked about the difference of the global north and south, but there's um, domestic environmental justice problems as well and have those been considered in the research so far that we have? Great, should we start with Dr. Bowser and then if you have, um, oh, oh, okay, go ahead, Dr. Fishlin, please. I must let his hand. Okay, um, maybe I can um, say something where I deviate a little bit uh, with Gilliam. Uh, my perception is not that the um, UNFCCC has made really big progress. Of course, you, you find some acknowledgement, but I have to say, having the words Mother Earth in, in the preamble of the Paris Agreement is not really that substantive progress as I think we actually need it. So, and I, I would even say at the moment we are a bit stuck um, uh, in terms of, in particularly the uh, differences between global north and global south. 
uh, we, we see a lot of impacts taking place uh, to a larger extent in the global south, while the global north has typically caused much more uh, of, of the global warming as we can observe it now. For instance, the United States has about 23% contributed to the current global warming, and no other single country has contributed so much. And China, uh, for instance, which is the biggest contributor since 2005 um, in terms of emissions, if you, if you look at the historical responsibility, it's still considerably smaller. It's only about 13%. So um, uh, climate justice is, is a very big issue. And because the climate finances, as they were promised in 2015, by 2020, we should have half 100 uh, billions per year in uh, the Green Fund, and we don't have it uh, yet. And we are in 2022. So I think we have some opening divide between the Global South and Global North at the moment. I hope it can be overcome in the forthcoming COP next month, but I have to say we have not only made uh, only progress, um, despite all these good efforts, which are of course laudable and are promising. So thank you for the question. I would just uh, uh, address the, the environmental justice part of it. Um, and respectfully disagree. I think that the, the, the inclusion and being in, at the room where the negoti negotiators introduced the term Mother Earth and the back ideas behind it and the coalition of countries that actually voted on that was an important moment. And you see that in COP26, and I hope we see it in COP27, where the, the youth who are part of the conversation now are heavily represented by the Global South and are in every part of the negotiation platform. And that's a, a fundamental change over the 15 years of the COP, is how to bring young voices in, how to bring new voices in, and how to promote change. The inclusion of the traditional and local knowledge, it's also important to realize that the, to, in the UN world, traditional and local knowledge is not just indigenous knowledge. It could be a local African-American yeah. community that has been there for 100 plus years. It could be an Hispanic community that was immigrant originally, but now has been in the same place for 100 years. So bringing that knowledge as part of the debate, because I think at the end of the day, what it does is, is basically two things. It, it broadens the participation of the scientists at the table, but it also broadens the perspective of the questions being asked. And you have to have both. You can't do one without the other. You can't just say we're going to have scientists who look like society, but we're still asking the same old questions. We have to ask different questions. So I think that was a pivotal moment to be, say that a cultural question is just as much part of a greenhouse gas question as not. Every landscape has a culture, and every culture has a landscape. And you just think about it that way. That's why the environmental and climate justice pieces are so important to be now even discussed in the COP. We're in COP15, they weren't discussed. Now we're, here we are, where it's a, a part and parcel of the conversation. But more importantly, I just think, to, again, to highlight the role of the youth and seeing that change over the 10 years I've been at the COP, where you would have one or two youth in the background doing a protest, to now there is a full summit where the room is full and where they have voice on the floor and the negotiating table. That is a fundamental difference. But if I may, if I may, Gilliam, I don't want to fight over uh, or quarrel over the question whether the glass is half full or half empty or, or whatever other fraction of the glass. Um, I fully agree with you um, that progress was made. Uh, the only thing I want to say, the glass is not full. Great. More questions? Or did you want to? You're okay. okay. Questions from the audience? Oh, good. Whimsy is right behind you. Um, all right, Addy. Um, I'm curious then if the movement um, in environmental justice um, and uh, organizations like the IPCC is, uh, in the way that you describe it, uh, fundamentally benefited by um, youth, especially moving to be greater parts of the organizations. Do are are you then seeing an issue or a contrast with legislative efforts where, especially in this country, the legislative bodies are not 
um, being majorly moved into youth voices? And is there a discrepancy there um, in trying to get things passed where there is a divide of uh, who has a voice in the debate on, on or in the discussion on either body? Do you want to start? Sure, I'll, I'll start on that. Um, so I'm one of the authors of the National Climate Assessment that the United States is undertaking, which is now in its third, um, third order draft. But for the first order draft, we actually hosted a youth dialogue um, to ask the question of what was the youth perspective on climate issues within the United States. So what's interesting is that, and you can all confess, you don't have to raise your hand, how many people have actually read the Federal Register? <laughs> Right? So, yeah, I'll raise your hand. So the part of the problem is that you know, the, the, the United States governments will post the National Climate Assessment on the Federal Register, and most students have no idea what that is or have never seen it. And it's the most remarkably boring piece of paper you could ever want to read. <laughs> um, I tell it's a good, a good solution for insomnia. But however, um, if you don't participate in the public process, which is required by law in the United States, um, which is the National, Environmental, the National Environmental Policy Act, requires every federal action to have public input. But if you sit on our national climate assessment as one of the authors, the only people who commented on were big NGOs until we actually hosted a youth dialogue. So we went back and said, this is not right. We need to get everybody's voice in there. So we hosted a youth dialogue with all the authors, not all the authors, a good number of authors on the ecosystems chapter to ask specifically about you, what you thought about biodiversity loss. And the number, what we did is, you know, everybody sort of mentimeter, we generate nice little word clouds and ask everybody to put in two words. What two words do you think is the most important for biodiversity and the national climate assessment? And which two words popped up? Environmental justice. Number one word, you think about urban heat islands, you can think about disease transmission and mosquitoes and this, that, and all the things, but yet the youth, the number one word, those two words were environmental justice. So it is so important to have that voice at the table, and so I appreciate you asking the question. I may have veered off your question a bit, but I think it has to be part and parcel. So in our biodiversity chapter, we went back through to look at where biodiversity loss has justice implications, or where, most importantly, biodiversity change has justice implications. So I work on things that have six legs, not too many with those with eight legs, and not into eight leg things, six leg things. Many of them carry diseases. Many of them carry, and they're very good at it. And they really like climate change. They can't thermoregulate, so they think climate change is pretty good stuff, right? Which populations get impacted by that change? Next summer, go outside. How many ticks do you see? They have eight legs. Um, so these are the types of shifts that end up having a justice component because they hit one segment of the side differently than they hit another segment of the side, however that segment identifies. Great. Dr. Fishland? Yeah. Um, we touched upon many things. Uh, what I wanted to contribute at this point is that maybe let me say first I'm convinced that any historical change actually requires many, many elements, uh, small, many small wheels which really act together and, and then can create some change, and that's what we need. Um, we need transformation in order to tackle the climate change problem and also all the social problems which come with it as well as the social problems we have otherwise. But uh, I wanted to emphasize to be cognizant of, of these many wheels, and IPC is only one of them. And IPCC is a bit more modest uh, than what Gilliam just described for the national assessment uh, for many reasons. One, one of them being that uh, it is uh, invented by the UN, if I make, or instituted by the UN and has to follow certain rules. And uh, it is quite clearly bound by its principles saying that IPCC can never go beyond research and only published research, preferably peer-reviewed published research, is the basis for any assessment which IPCC is doing. And any policy prescriptiveness, uh, the 
policy makers, uh, in particularly from the UNFCCC, are very alert and, and immediately uh, refute that in case if some scientist should naively overstep some of, of this. So it is a, it is a important wheel. I think we would have no idea where we are currently without the IPCC. On the other hand, the IPCC has very clear limits. And in as much as, for instance, the uh, climate use, as we call it in, in my region, um, for instance, or in as much as women, or in as much as other um, less uh, favored by society, uh, humans and groups of people uh, are concerned. I think um, this, this is something which needs first to be really um, studied and published in the scientific literature before IPCC could ever pick it up and, and bring it to, uh, to the policy arena. On the other hand, I think uh, the policymakers have very good ways of bypassing IPCC when it comes to these questions, as Gilliam has so nicely described earlier on. Yeah, who's at the table really impacts and changes what questions are being raised and what moves forward. So we're going to have a PowerPoint here in just a minute to kind of inspire change. And it really actually links well to one of the uh, virtual audience questions. So we really aspire here at Dickinson to encourage students to be change makers, um, to not only reimagine a more equitable world, but to actively work to achieve these uh, changes and think of themselves as people that can inspire and, and uh, make change. So um, one of our audience members virtually asked, how can we as college students make a difference and also provide support from eco-anxiety? Uh, that's from Khalil Hill Show. So Dr. Bowser is going to run us through 10 climate actions that you as students can actually achieve. Um, and then we'll pass it over to Dr. Fishlin for his thoughts on change making and close out the session. So thank you for that. Thank you for that, and uh, hopefully all, all the slides will work. I just wanted to say real briefly that this, you know, for me, the, the, what's so exciting about this forum is to see all the students present and to say you know, that you're the next generation of change agents, and so how do we inspire it? But I think the one word we haven't talked about yet is, is actually just citizen science, and how do you actually get engaged? And we talk about biodiversity loss, and for many of elements of biodiversity, we don't have the data because they're very hard to measure. So when we came up with these ideas of climate actions, it was to, what can you do right now, right here, that actually does have a huge difference in where our data sits and where our data goes. So I just gave them numbers to make it fun. Number one, oops, is this idea of paying attention, which is you're here. But it's an important thing to pay attention to why things are measurable by everybody. Everybody, everyone has a cell phone in their back pocket which means you can measure ecosystem integrity in one step at war, because the observations of organisms is part of this change that we're seeing. No, I'm not advancing. Is it not going? Maybe try the right. Ah, there, there we go. go. OK. Number two, what is the linkages among organisms? Small things carry diseases, and those diseases move very fast. So what is the linkage between human health and a small organism, between your health, somebody else's health, et cetera? So thinking about the linkages of things is really important. Number three, and this is important, this came out of the, the earlier con, um, panel, people protect what they understand. They protect what they understand. So if you give the idea of climate change and you want to say you need to do climate action, you need to protect what you understand and to think about how you can help other people understand it. I work on pollinators. Most people don't understand pollinators. Number four, and I'll say this, say this one twice, small things tell big stories. Things that respond very quickly to climate change are things that you can measure with your cell phone. Their life cycles very fast, their populations change very rapidly, they shift their ranges very quickly, and you can take a picture of every single one of them on your cell phone. Small insects tell big stories about a changing climate. Number five, that cell phone again. I like to tell my students, you, you have science in your back pocket. Your cell phone can do amazing things. We cannot answer the question about pollinators because we don't know their populations. Most pollinate native bees. How many native bees are in this state? Probably over 200 species of native bees, most of which are unknown. 
or poorly known. So we can't even answer the question about biodiversity loss until we take those observations, which is number two. Number six, like I said again, small things tell big stories. Pay attention to those small things. When you see that white butterfly flying around, it's out there right now, you'll see it in the spring. That's an invasive species that's having a grand time with climate change. That's a story of how our changes, our story of our changing spring, story of changing phenology. Small things tell big stories. Number seven, communicate. You have to be able to communicate people about science. And one of the things I like about thinking about communication is use a different form. Do art, do music, do voice, do something, because people protect what they understand. And if you don't take that action to help people understand, we know, and, and IPCC does a fabulous job on art. There's beautiful art in all the IPCC reports, and it's trying to tell that story. Number eight, just take, go to your national park, <laughs> go to your city park. What does an ecosystem that is intact even look like? Do you know what it looks like? Do you know how it's changing? And do you know whether those changes are permanent or temporary? So go to a park, whether it's a mountain or your local city park. And number nine is be part of the conversation. Share your voice, because you know, this, the year of the youth is 2030, according to the UN. And so the next generation, like the IPCC said, we should be training our fellows to be that group of scientists and have a clear path as to you are the fellow, and then you should be the author in four years. You know, it should be a really clear path. The National Climate Assessment, same thing. Change your path. And the number 10, just to end on, to think about every landscape has a culture, and every culture has a landscape. So we look at biodiversity change and loss, is understanding that there's a culture behind there somewhere. You can just look at bees and look how many cultural pieces have bees in them. Look at the monarch butterfly and what story is it trying to tell. So I just wanted to share those 10 slides, um, and I think you'll share them in your class, to think about what you can do right now, right here. You don't need to be you know, a, a high, high fluting scientist or on the IPCC, but what you can do is start those small actions which tell us big data that allow us to understand the biodiversity loss response to climate change. And that's what gets into the assessment reports, but we have to get that research into the assessment reports. So think about, how your role can be part of that solution. That was really helpful, Dr. Bowser, because I always encourage students to think through, we all have different roles to play, and it doesn't mean that everyone is you know, at the policymaking table or, or actually out collecting samples. So again, use this as a moment to affirm for yourself what is your particular role and what are your strengths and how can you have your voice heard. Dr. Fishland, do you have any thoughts on this uh, question? Yes. Um, first of all, thanks, Gilliam. Excellent, uh, these 10 actions. Um, but I have to tell you, not everyone has a cell phone on this globe. In the Global South, we have many, many people without the cell phone still. Uh, let's not forget that. Um, I would like to emphasize that, indeed, um, equity issues need it addressed more than they were addressed previously. And climate justice has really to be established with a very, very high priority. It's not something which come afterwards. And I think uh, whenever we, uh, when I think of the action seven um, or action nine, I have to say in my region, the uh, climate use has had an incredible impact. I felt as a scientist, I was preaching and preaching, if I may say so, and it was incredible in what short period of time the climate youth was able to suddenly get the policy making moving. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic came in and a lot of this momentum was lost. But um, I hope, nevertheless, this will come back again. And I think it is essential because it is respected uh, by all sorts of um, uh, policy uh, factions that the youth has a right of a decent future. And I think to claim that and to uh, engage in whatever role you are playing, as Heather just said, uh, it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you think of climate change and play your role, the better it is. Um, 
And I think we, you need to urge policymakers, as this Action 9, as Gilliam said, uh, would like to emphasize that one. This is very, very important, and I still believe it is underestimated the irreversible climate change which is happening right now. Unless we have net zero, there is no way to get any temperature, any warming level we reached um, to reverse. We will live, we will have to live with that for thousands of years, uh, for instance. And so I think this is something which um, the youth has a, has a very important role to play. And let me perhaps add one more point. Sometimes there is a risk of getting frustrated because, for instance, the limit to 1.5 degree, as we were hoping after Paris um, in 2015, that this might be a viable um, goal, if I may say so. Um, maybe we, in 10 years or 15 years, it might well be that the world is already at 1.5 and we have not managed to get the emissions uh, really decreasing after 2025 globally. And if we fail there, please do not despair. I mean, it would be uh, to throw the towel is the worst response. And I think that there is one nice aspect about climate change, the serious it is, the threatening it is, and that is whatever effort we are making to curb global warming is worth it because it means millions of people have a more decent life. Every fraction of a degree warming matters and every year matters. And I think this is something uh, which, which is also a hope that all the struggle now and in the future is worth it when it comes to uh, stop global warming and hopefully after that reduce it. Great. Thank you so much to Dr. Fischel and Dr. Bowser for a wonderful panel. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, Gillian's uh, 10 actions uh, um, uh, really resonate. I'd just like to see, so do we have any citizen scientists who help with monitoring watersheds here in the audience? There we go, from Alarm, mm -hmm. great. Do we have some citizen beekeepers for the Hive Cooperative? Are they in the audience? We've got some up in the back, okay. Do we have some student farmers in the audience? Yes, we've got our student farmers here as well. Do we have some students who might be doing a county food assessment for Cumberland County? Are you in the audience? Yeah, that's my class. <laughs> some students who are doing some work uh, for Carlisle, looking at green spaces, recreational spaces. Hey, we've got some here. Any other citizen scientists here want to shout out what you're working on? Did you leave out pollinators? <laughs> the high beekeepers, and they work so, with the pollinators, yes. Yeah, but they're not native to North America. <laughs> we, have, we have a pollinator garden right outside Kaufman Hall. Maggie Douglas knows a good deal about it, which has native pollinators there as well. So yes, we've got the European bees that we've got over by our, our science center, but we also uh, are very much embracing our native uh, pollinators as well. So um, with that, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, thank Heather for, for moderating, Gillian, Andreas, it's a pleasure to see you even remotely uh, uh, once again. Um, thank you to our audience uh, here in the room. Thank you to our virtual audience. Um, our next session will begin at uh, 1.30 on food, agriculture, water, and climate change. I'm very much looking forward to that. I hope you will be back to join us uh, uh, for that. Thank you very much. Heather? William? Oh, you no longer hear me, I guess. <laughs>